We welcome all of you tonight in Jesus' name. It is uh, truly good to be here. Amen. Welcome those also who have joined us on live stream. We're continuing in Genesis tonight. This will be our 73rd lesson in Genesis. We'll be in the 45th chapter, verses 16 through 28. As Pharaoh hears about the coming of Joseph's household. <coughs> Genesis 45, 16 through 28. And the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brethren are come. And it pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, This do ye, laid your beasts, and go, get you into the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households, and come unto me. And I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and ye shall eat the fat of the land. Now thou art commanded, this do ye, take you wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones, and for your wives, and bring your father, and come. Also regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. And the children of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh, and gave them provision for the way. To all of them he gave each man changes of raiment, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. And to his father he sent after this manner ten asses laden with the good things of Egypt and ten she-asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. So he sent his brethren away, and they departed. And he said unto them, See that ye fall not out by the way. And they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father. And told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he's a governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons, which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. One of the great uh, epochs of Scripture. <coughs> now in this we're seeing a principle that's declared in Scripture and is, is uh, made known throughout the Scripture that joy comes in the morning. There's a principle you want to get hold of. David penned it down this way. Weeping may, because it may not too, weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. Now we've seen this several times in the book of Genesis. For Abraham had involved a journey to a mountain where he was to offer up Isaac as a burnt offering to God, but when he came down the mountain, the morning had come, and he was rejoicing. Amen. Huh? Amen. For Isaac, it involved not being able to dwell in peaceable surroundings when he was in Gerar, mm -hmm. and coming to realize that Rebekah was barren, but joy came in the morning, yeah. and Rebe he had peaceable surroundings, and Rebekah had twins. For Jacob, Sorrow attended the absence of Joseph, his favored son. He was sure he'd been killed by a wild beast. For Joseph's brothers, the thought of them being punished for their sins two decades prior brought fear and trepidation to them. Yet for them both, joy came in the morning. Amen. For Joseph, the hatred of his brothers, so he had to endure that probably for the full 17 years that he was with them. 
His father rebuked him for his dream. Spent a number of years in prison, accused falsely. But then joy came in the morning. And he's a, see, see how, how does a person recover from hardship and sorrow? For Job, his disease was healed and he received twice as much as he had before. Joy came in the morning. How, how, did, how did Paul recover from, from that incident he described in 2 Corinthians 8, 1, 8, and 9, where he said, uh, Our trouble which came in to us in Asia, in our trouble we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the centers of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raises the dead. How would he recover from that? He said, we had no rest, we were trouble on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. How did he recover? Joy came yeah, right. Amen. in the morning. Can we learn from these holy men that our path is not meant to be strewn with roses, mm -hmm. nice greenery all around and blue skies every day. There are difficult experiences for the child of God, dark and foreboding experiences. Yeah. We don't wish them for anybody, but they are a reality. If you haven't passed through any, you will. And if you have, you'll pass through some more. We have this word from the king. Joy comes in the morning. Yeah. And how can this be experienced? Be, well, you can't make it happen. Yeah. That's why it says joy comes. Mm -hmm. Doesn't say we obtain it. Joy comes mm -hmm. in the morning. You can't. You can't answer this uh, intellectually. You can't explain it that way. You can't diagram it out. You don't know when it's going to come in the morning, but the night may be a long night. Yeah, that's right. Might be an extended night. Yes. I was just considering this parallel that I most recently seen um, with the recent movie that came out, The Hobbit, and this parallel that the man who wrote the book, he brought out, they came to this path, and there was this dark forest, and the atmosphere was very hard for them to breathe, but they had to go through, and it was very dark, and... They had to find the light. They kept telling each other, we need to find the light, because once we find the light, we'll be able to find the path, because they have been told, if you lose your way on this path, it will be very difficult to find it once again. So you need to have light to be able to see, and once they came to the light, they were able to breathe. Mm -hmm. And I saw this parallel that during these trials, the Lord is telling us to look for the light, mm -hmm. and it will make it easier. It won't mean that That's the right. trial will be ended. It will mm -hmm. just mean that... You will be able to come through. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. See the other alternative. This is this is a temptation. Despair is a temptation. Yes, sir. Discouragement is a temptation. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what it is. A temptation. It's a very real experience. Yeah, Make no uh, mistake about this. Mm -hmm. It's not a sin. As long as you don't stay in it. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. It's becoming faint-hearted. Yeah. See. Now, for Jacob, this lasted 22 years. For Joseph, it lasted 22 years. So it was a long, long period of time. But joy came in the morning, waiting on the Lord. That's, that's what that's all about. <coughs> now, if Joseph has put everybody out of the room except him and his brothers. They're there by, they're there by themselves. And he commences to weep, it was the weeping of joy. It was so loud. See, it's hard for Western culture to understand this. To them, loud means a rock concert or a football game. That's when people. That's what people in our society get loud. Mm -hmm. But when they're overjoyed or over sorrowed, people in the East, that's when they get loud. Mm -hmm. They wail. And. Uh, the people they brought out of the room, they, they heard it. 
And it, now the, the, re, the report of it gets to Pharaoh's house. The fame was heard. Joseph's brethren are come. And Pharaoh was very glad. Boy, he was very, very glad about this. It pleased Pharaoh well and, and his servants. They were very, very glad about this. Why? There's some people I know that if their relatives were coming, I would not be glad. Hmm? This is just the truth. Now. I'm just telling you the truth. There's some people that left such a bad impression on the people that they're, they're hoping they don't meet anybody else that knows these people. But Joseph hadn't lived like that. Joseph had conducted his life in such a manner as Pharaoh was glad to hear the rest of the family was coming. Yeah. Amen. See, you want to live in such a way that so people know you and you say, our whole church is coming over to your house that they won't faint <laughs> and be filled with fear. Mm -hmm. Thinking they all come pointing the fingers and say, you will know, the man. Uh -huh. So jo Joseph had lived well. He'd lived representatively, properly. Yes. He was not, uh, he was trustworthy, he wasn't a rabble-rouser, he wasn't slothful, he was a good servant. <laughs> Here's what Stephen said about Joseph. The patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. Yeah. Uh -huh. and gave him favor and wisdom, gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt over all his house. So he was such a man that people look and said, we, we don't have anybody in Egypt like this man. Uh, I want him to run the house. Yeah. <laughs> Good reports. Good reports. He's written of Cornelius. You remember him? He was of good report yeah, yeah. among the nation of the Jews. Ananias, that's the man that was sent to Saul of Tarsus, you remember, to mm -hmm. set him apart. He was a devout man according to the law and of good report yes, amen. of all the Jews that dwelt there. Paul said elders must have a good report of them that are without. The sinners have to think highly of these men. Yeah, that's what, just what it says. John the Apostle said of one of his contemporaries, Demetrius hath a good report of all men. So I ask you, I mean, what is the, what is the report you have? What's to talk about you? When, when you're people around you, what, it, what do they think? Maybe you don't know, but you should pick up on it. Yeah. To pick up on it, not bury your head in the sand. Pick up on it. What kind of impression you've left with people. Because some, if you leave a good one, then your words will have more weight, carry more weight. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so Pharaoh hears about this, and he calls for Joseph. And he gives him uh, some orders. He says, now, um, laid your, tell your brothers, tell your brothers, laid your beast or load your beast, and go get you into the land of Canaan. T -t 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 well, Joseph had already told him that, see? He said to tell him. Some people say, well, he said that because Joseph told him what he said. But I, I choose not to believe that. A lot of commentaries, they, 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 that's what they think. Some pulpit commentary takes that, that he merely confirmed what Joseph had said to him. You know. John Gill, who's normally a reputable commentator, said it cannot be imagined that Pharaoh would say what follows upon a bare report without having any further account of things from Joseph. See, I, I choose to reject those. Even though I accept those men, I choose to re Amen. reject that. I think this was God orchestrating things. Yes, he put in Pharaoh the same thing he put in Joseph. Yes, God can take the same thing, put it in the hearts of two different people, yes. two different positions, two different stages. He can do that. He can take the same thing. Yes. Yes. We've experienced that yes. some here. Yes. Amen. Someone will have shared some great truth they've seen. God had put that in our heart, too. We, we saw it, too. Yes. This is how God works. Mm -hmm. 
I love to think about it. Yeah, it's like a confirmation. Well, when that happens, and you're right, it has happened several mm -hmm. times. Yes. It's a confirmation that the thing wasn't your idea. God, God That's allowed right. you to see it, and He allows someone else, and then when it comes together, it glorifies That's God. That's right. Amen. Now, see, that God has access to people's hearts. We know this. As you said in the scripture, it's of another type of thing, but he says, God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom to the beast. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah that's it. God did that. Yes. A beast that was governed by Satan. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God put it in the hearts of these other reprobates, yes. put it in their heart uh -huh. yeah. to go along. Yes. Go along. Well, that accounts for the success of a lot of things. Yes, it does. See, some people, here's how it works. Some people are living way off in the never never land. We're a distance from God. They're not close to God. Everything they know about God is a guess. They really don't know anything. They guess. That's all. They just guess or surmise. Yeah. And some theological nut arises. And has some strange ideas. Yeah. And God takes these other people uh -huh. and he puts it in their heart uh -huh. to agree with what that nut is saying. Yeah. Uh -huh. Amen. And that's why they have a mega church. That's, right. yeah. that's why they're just a collecting point for the insincere. Uh -huh. yeah. Amen. Yes. Oh, I know that sounds bad, but it's, this is the truth. Uh -huh. God's running things. Yeah. His sheep, now they hear his voice. They won't follow a stranger, but the others will. <coughs> and he says, I, go, I want you to go and, and do this right away. Go and get you into the land. See, do it. Don't go home and have a committee meeting about this. Do this right away. Like Joseph, Pharaoh calls for immediate action. That's the same thing, Joseph. Joseph, do it now. Don't spend a couple more weeks here in Egypt and enjoy things are here. Just right now, go back there and get get my father and their household to bring them here. We know from a later word involved that no one was allowed to stay, which itself is like a miracle. He had 70 people. Different ages, different genders, different time periods, different personalities. They all agreed right off the bat to come to Egypt. How why that happened? That's God working. That's what that is. Do it. They did it right away. It's, everything has to be done right away. See, there's, there's things in the kingdom of God, brethren, you got to do when you know about them. You can't linger. You can't wait. You can't put it off. He that knows to do good and doesn't do it, it's sin, yeah, the scripture amen. says. See? Amen. Right. So some people that get this notion flies through their mind, I should do this for the Lord, I should do that, I should live for the Lord, but they don't. Mm. They're disobedient. Yes. And unless they get that thing corrected, mm -hmm. this will condemn them. Yeah. Amen. Serious business. Do it right away. <coughs> <coughs> do it right away. Be with, that means they'd be willing to come. See the advantages of coming. And see, then this would fulfill something God said to Abraham. He said, your seed are going to be strangers, sojourners in a strange land. See, now that had to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. This that we're reading about is the beginning of that fulfillment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there couldn't be like a, some stragglers left behind. They all had to come. So while he's working here in Egypt with his bro with Joseph's brothers, he's still working there at home with his father and yeah. so forth. So that when they're told they have to come, they will get up and come. They will get up and come. This is actually a type of the experience of salvation. The gospel announces a, announces a provision that can only be realized by disconnecting from this present world. Yeah. I, that disconnect has to take place. They had to leave Canaan to get to Egypt. 
and you had to leave the world to come to Jesus. There's all kinds of people that say they come to Jesus, haven't left the world. Well, they haven't come to Jesus. I'm sorry they haven't come to Jesus. I'm sorry they have not come to Jesus. Because you can't come to Jesus without leaving the world. That's what coming to Jesus involves. We've eliminated a whole lot of professing Christendom right there. <laughs> and he tells them, he said, um, now I'll give you the good of the land of Egypt. You're going to have to believe me on this. I'll send a little some tokens along. I'll send some tokens along for you, but I'll give you the good. You've got to know that you'll be more than compensated for leaving your homes. Do you, do you believe this in your heart? Do you believe God will give you something in exchange, something of value in exchange for you cutting the ties? Yeah. Yeah. So, some people don't believe this. Right. Amen. Yeah. I don't know of anyone who's really preaching this. Yeah. But this is the truth. Yeah. And anyone who's cut the ties and made the trip will tell you, hey, it's even better than we thought. Amen. You Christ more than anything That's else, right. yes. you won't do it. Yeah. That's right. Amen. Now, if they didn't respect Joseph uh -huh. and Pharaoh, they'd have never done this. That's right. That's right. Amen. Joseph and Pharaoh are like God and Jesus. Yeah. You can imagine these brothers going back and, and t telling them about uh, about Joseph being in charge and how good things were there mm -hmm. in Egypt. They're going through a famine there. That's right. So I mean, they're, 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 you got the comparison. We're we're in the middle of a of a bad famine here where we're living now. But some, someone stands up there and they start talking about heaven and all these exceeding great and precious promises. And it, that, if that doesn't draw you, nothing will. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, the famine was in Egypt too. Mm -hmm. But Egypt was prepared to live in a famine. Amen. So we're, we admit there's a famine in the world. We admit there is. Yeah. But see, we're living where there's, there's supplies for a famine. Amen. Amen. It's stuff that was grown when there wasn't a famine. Yeah, yeah. yeah supplies. Yeah, that person has to believe that. Mm -hmm. I'll give you the good of the land of Egypt. That is, the choicest things that are here will be will be yours. When Joseph had told him, you'll live in Goshen. And Pharaoh, when he actually met the family face to face, he said, in the land of Goshen, let them dwell. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And evidently was a very good area, particularly for agricultural people. They were people that were agricultural people and raised livestock. And that's the kind of people they were. So you don't, you don't put people like that in a city. Yeah. You put them in a land that's suited for that. <laughs> and, in, and actually, according to the promise, in that it's in Egypt that the people begin to multiply. Mm -hmm. They didn't multiply in Canaan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They've been in Canaan for several decades, yeah. and it's still only 70. Yeah. Mm -hmm. huh? But when they got to this other land, where there was supply, consistent supplies, they'd multiply exceedingly in that land. And he told them, "You'll eat the <coughs> the good. You'll eat the fat of the land." So, well, there was a famine in the land. How could you eat the fat of the land? Well, the fat had been reaped and stored in granaries, Amen. and you'd be eating of the, of the granary in Goshen. Mm -hmm. And it sounded like Goshen probably had the best crops. So the, the best grain was stored in Goshen, and that's where they were, that's where they were going. They, they'd eat of the fat of the land. That's the fat of the land that had been harvested, you see. And why was all this true? Because of Joseph. Amen. It's because of Joseph. Yes. That's why this is so. Mm -hmm. One for Joseph, they wouldn't have been able to live in Goshen. They wouldn't have received the good of the land. You can see the parallel in Christ. Yeah. God's good to you. Because of Christ. Mm -hmm. yes. He has forgiven you, the scripture says, for Christ's sake. Mm -hmm. So, whatever you may think about God loving you and all of this and all of that, there's the element of truth to it. 
but it's still you take Christ out of the scenario and there's no love for God of God for you or the world. Yeah, that's right. If you take Christ out, that doesn't exist. That's why God didn't talk like that yeah, right. prior to Christ. He didn't talk about his love for the world prior to Christ. Yeah. Hmm? He had a lot of rebukes for it, but he didn't talk about it. But as soon as Christ was enthroned, then this, for, for Christ's sake, just like for Joseph's sake. Now, we learn from this, too, that where you're positioned is important. For Israel to prosper in Egypt, they had to be in a place conducive to it, Goshen. They had to be in Goshen. There were two more years of famine, and they were going to live there. It had, to, it had to be a good good place where they were living. Joseph told him, when you, when you meet later, Joseph told him, when you meet Pharaoh and he asked you about your occupation, here's what he told him to say. It's a country pass, and Pharaoh shall tell, call you and shall say, What is your occupation? That ye shall say, Thy servant's trade hath been about cattle, and from our youth even until now, both we and also our fathers, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen. Mm -hmm. we got to have a lot of pasture land. Yeah. Don't forget to tell them that. Because living in Goshen has got to make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. There has to be a purpose to living in, yeah. in Goshen. Now, you know this already, I'm sure. There are staggering numbers of professing Christians whose lives have stalemated mm -hmm. because they're in the wrong place. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. They're where there isn't an abundance of food. So they stalemated. Yeah. Where they are, rarely do they have anything food for the soul. So you got to be in the right place. Mm -hmm. Now, professing Christians, they'll offer all kinds of explanations for why they remain in unproductive environments. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it'll be because we've got a lot of friends there. Others will say it's because of my relatives are there. Some will say, well, I want to, I want to change them. That's why I'm there. Well, there's all kind of, I have a ministry there, whatever. All kind of explanations. But while they're giving their explanations, their soul is withering. Yeah, that's right. And because they know more than the other people in that environment, they overestimate where they are. Yeah, that's right. They could have probably been 21 and robust and strong, and instead they're eight. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it's because of where they're at. You can't live without nourishment. You can say, well, I'll feed myself. Well, that's not the way God arranged this. Yeah. If you're on the Isle of Patmos yeah. or you're in prison, yeah. even there God will send you someone else. Yeah. Like he did Paul, send him Epaphroditus, yeah. send him Onesiphorus, send him Onesimus, send him Epaphras. Mm -hmm. You can't really live by yourself unless you've got some kind of special ministry like John the Revelator did. Uh -huh. And then he didn't die on Patmos. Yes. There's also something to be said about those who are in a good and a right environment of being able to use well what's available. That's right. Mm -hmm. So that you can yes. make the progress. You can have the abundance be profitable to you. Amen. Mm -hmm. I trust everybody can, mm -hmm. can see this because a lot of people's spiritual condition is the result of their choices. Uh, yeah, amen. They've got, I understand, they've got reasons they present. When I was in the that straight, I had reasons too, but finally the Lord took them all away. <laughs> and I saw, well, they, these are bad reasons. After, after so long, you come to find out, well, maybe I can't do what I thought I could do here. Mm -hmm. yeah. I got to do it from another location. See, what happens is that when you're not in the right place, truth is like rationed, yeah. rationed out to you. And the, the quality is rationed and the quantity is rationed. But where, when you're where God intends, and he intends for you to be where you can grow up into Christ in all things, then you, they'll be sufficient for you to do that. You won't have to go someplace else to have it happen. <laughs> 
those who don't do this, they've been victimized by Satan. See, they've, they've, they've learned to live with a, with a mind that's not God's mind. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. And they've learned to live with that condition because they're in the wrong place. Now, thou art commanded, Pharaoh says. Yes, but I've been exposed to people and discussed this issue with people that uh, would take issue with what you've just said about mm -hmm. being in the wrong place and, mm -hmm. and rations and being limited and things like this. They say, well, nothing's too hard for the Lord. Mm. And they say, all things are possible to, to him who believes. And they can put together quite a list of, mm -hmm. of scriptures mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. And I think what is what is overlooked is that the the Lord has has uh, ways and manners in which there is a more excellent way. Yes. yes. And uh -huh. so at one level, yes, it's all things are possible. Mm -hmm. All things are possible with God. But there's a there's a higher higher level mm -hmm. where a closer I, I, I guess I should say a closer proximity mm -hmm. uh, to God that don't allow certain influences and certain things uh, so it's just it's just not quite that simple it's right like yeah. to say all you know all things are possible with God and so I can be disobedient and he can still save me so that's mm. the that's the wrong. That's the wrong place to use that text. Amen. Yeah. See, God has ways. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's not one of His ways. Uh -huh. Amen. Paul couldn't stay in the Pharisees. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He eventually had to cut cords, cut lines with them. Uh -huh. Now, re flesh would reason, but if you, if Paul would have remained in that place of a Pharisee and on maybe part of the Sanhedrin, he could have influenced more people. Huh. That's human reasoning. God has never said anything like that. That's right. He's never said anything like that in any dispensation. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. What do you think coming out from among them means? Yeah. Uh -huh. What do you think unequal yoke means? There's a certain situation God will not work on that condition. Yeah comes a time when Hagar and Ishmael got to leave the house. At the beginning of his walk of faith where he thought he should stay in Jerusalem. He yeah. reasoned with the Lord. That's right. Mm -hmm. They know what I did to you. Yeah. And the Lord said, depart. No, That's right. Leave this place. That's They'll right. not listen to you here. Mm -hmm. it's a per this is something you can't legislate this to somebody else. This is something you have to see. Right. We're declaring this and hope that people will see it. But we can't pass a law that you got to do this. It has to be the result of what you see. And he says, now, uh, <laughs> take wagons now out of Egypt for for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. This trip be a long trip for them. Bring, send along some wagons. Wagons are made to transport people and goods. They have wheels and they're made to transport long distances. We estimate this distance to be approximately 200 miles. That's a pretty good uh, estimation. It was desert land. <laughs> it wasn't nice lush fields along the way, you know, it wasn't that type of thing. So there's, he gave them some relative ease. It still was gonna be a laborious trip, but see it, he lessened, he lessened it, the labor of it for them. For maximum transportation would have to be for 70 people, uh -huh. and plus if any servants or handmaids or if they herded their flocks along, any of them. That I mean, there's some other considerations, but it was quite an entourage traveling along. And to bring your father now. Don't just go down there and bring the children. Bring your father and come. He makes clear Joseph's brothers were not to forget their primary, the primary one to be brought back was their father. Amen. Don't forget that. And J Joseph made the same demand. In the 45th chapter, verse 13, he says, bring my father. He made the same, see if they hear where they were in sync. There was to be was no separation of the household of Jacob. With some in Canaan, some in Egypt. 
They all had to. And so Abraham, when he went down to Egypt during a famine, he took Sarah and his service with, with him down there. He didn't leave some of them back here in the famine. Bring them all down. Uh, this is parallels the journey to glory, of course. You can see, <laughs> you, as you can see, in our case, the wagons are like churches. Clusters of interdependent brethren journeying along uh, together in a kind of spiritual caravan uh, to the glory. And we've also been given provision for the way because Joseph gave him provision for the way. They didn't have to stop and hunt for food and scrounge around for food or buy food. He got it, got it in the wagons there. The fundamental issue with us is as with Jacob and his household, is getting to the appointed destination. That's <laughs> it's not. Oh, we're going to have to take a trip. This is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a trip. You know, me, you know children, we go on a vacation. The trip was a, just a trip was a lot of fun because you see stuff along the way. We think about the trip. We were too young to think about destination. We mm -hmm. children don't think destination. They think along the way. Mm -hmm. Well, spiritual people when they're children, they don't think about destination either. They think about it along the way. But the destination, that was the... You're to end up standing before Pharaoh. Now, the way to our long home, as Solomon called it, our long home, some versions call it our eternal home. Along the way, we're attended with some fellowship along the way, fellowship of brethren, fellowship of God, fellowship of Christ, fellowship of the Spirit. These are, some of the provisions are all spiritual blessings, are all things that pertain to life and godliness. These are provisions for the way. Amen. If you're not on the way, you don't even have access to these things. Yeah. These things are in the wagons. Yeah. See? They're not on the road. Yeah. So if a person's not traveling to glory, he will not be allowed access to the food necessary to get to glory. You can't sell this. You can't put it in a book so people who are not on their way to glory, knowledgeably and intentionally on their way to glory, can get some of the benefits. Oh, these benefits aren't for those people. You got to be in the wagons. You have to be in the wagons to have access to these benefits. And while they're traveling, think about this now. Don't regard any of your stuff. Now, you've accumulated a lot of possessions, and it may be hard to leave some of it behind, but don't, don't be thinking about what you've got to leave behind. Because all the good of the land of Egypt, you're gonna, what we got here is better than what you got there. Now, don't you think anything at all about leaving there? Leave that, you'll burden down the wagons with a bunch of stuff. Make it hard, make the trip harder. Amen. You may have to throw some of the wheat overboard. Like that ship Paul was on. <laughs> wheat they threw overboard. Because <laughs> of just too much stuff. Of course, that, that probably doesn't happen today. People have too much stuff. <laughs> Got too much stuff in their life. <laughs> so they're just creeping. If they are in the wagon, the wagon got to go so slow, you may never... And you can't have as much food mm. to make room for your stuff. You can't have as much food. Yeah. Oh, well, there's no need to develop this further. You can see see the member, see how important this is. <coughs> yeah, Brother Gavin, as you were talking about that, a vision came to my mind. If you, a lot of people have heard of these people called hoarders. <laughs> and uh, you see pictures and video of, of people's homes where they can't get rid of anything. <laughs> they have to keep everything. And so it gets to where you can't even live. You can't even move. And um, yeah. I was thinking that there's people like that with, with the world. They just they, they want it all. But the problem is that you can't have it all. Uh, you, you, you're going to have to give something up at some point in time. And it's going to, you know, what will a man give in exchange for his own soul? Amen. And uh, we've been given an opportunity 
to travel with Christ to glory. Yeah. Now that's quite an honor. Of course, you got to give up this world to do it. Yeah, don't worry about your stuff. Amen. Mm. Yeah, when someone comes to Christ, we we should tell them, don't 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 worry about the stuff you're going to have to give up. Because see, the world's alone. You're going to have to give up this. You're going to have to give up that. No, don't worry about what you have to give up. It's what you're getting that's the main thing. It's what you're getting. It's what you're getting. Amen. Judah. Talked about the man who had a legion of demons in him. I, th I think it was actually Brother Aaron. He said, "If that many devils can fit into him, how much of God can get in there?" That's mm -hmm. right. Much more. And if you take out the things that's already in there, you're going to be all that much more room for God for good things to go in because yeah. they won't mix. They yeah. won't go together. You have to yeah. get it out so you can put the good in. Mm -hmm. Now this is a in our culture. This is a very, very difficult thing to persuade people of this truth. In fact, if you do, it's like r really rare. It's occasion for shouting if just one. If you just, it's just some one person sees what you're saying and throws everything overboard for Jesus. It's like a miracle. And like you rejoice in it. See, that's the kind of society we're living in. But here in this, all of them did this. The whole group did this. <coughs> now, incidentally, in this 21st verse, he refers to the brothers and their families as, quote, the children of Israel. Now, this is the first time this phrase has been used in a contemporary sense. Something's happening right now. Before the children of Israel was a, was a prophetic view, this is the first time it's mentioned in a contemporary sense. A lot of the versions say sons, and technically that is technically that is right, but even more technically, spiritually, it's not. He's not talking about just the, the sons of Jacob. He's talking about children of Israel are a nation. See, whatever you and whenever you read that phrase in Scripture. Children of Israel. He's talking about the body of Israelites. That's what he's talking about. And this is the nation of Israel in an, em an embryo. That's where it is. And they were told to get the whole nation because the whole nation is going to grow up in Egypt. Get the whole nation. Bring them here. <coughs> Members of a group, not of a family. <coughs> And it fulfills the word he gave to Abraham in Genesis 15 about them, of, about the people. Your seed as a group will go down into Egypt as a group, and they'll grow in Egypt as a group, and they'll come out as a group. See this? That's the way it is with the church. We're actually traveling in a group. And within the group, there are groups. <laughs> like wagons within a wagon train. And we're all going the same place, Amen. see. So we don't want our fellowship to be out of sync with the fellowship of other wagons. Amen. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. We ought to be going the same place, have to have access to the same, same food. Now, the parallel in the spiritual life is uh, he gave them provision for the way. That provision was in the wagons. That's where it was. You want these provisions? It's in the wagons. The parallel in the spiritual life is eating is edification. Being nourished as edification is the spiritual process that equates to being sustained by supplies and food. So in the clusters of brethren, that's where you get the edification, where one edifies another. When you're by yourself now, God can, God can minister to you. Make no mistake about this. But the bulk of the ministry is what you get from other members of the household who haven't necessarily got the same thing you did. It's perfectly harmonious. It perfectly fits together. But he he gives this person that and this person the other, and then they come together. And they that's how God has ordained that we grow. Amen. You can't stay at home and read your Bible and do it diligently 
unless that's all that you don't have access to anything else, and end up knowing what somebody who's taking advantage of the body knows. You can't. Go ahead, Brother Tony. That's about the only way to get a balanced diet. Mm -hmm. That's right. Is to get a little bit of what everybody has brought. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, you get, and that way it's uh, balanced out for you. See, because yeah. what, what God gives a person coincides with their experience, with their level of attainment, yeah. with their insight. So God will give someone with a lot more insight than you've got. He will give it to them. And then because they're kindred brethren, they can give it to you. Yeah. See, that, that's how the thing is designed to work. And when you submit to this process, you will grow. That, that's the way it is. Those of us who have been in the alternative <laughs> know the value yeah. of these things because of what we have here and how we all benefit. Yes. We all benefit from our reciprocity, our giving yes, and receiving amen. of one amen. another and what God has put in each of us and how we've given amen. And We've been in places where there was... You know, one or two, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Right. Who had something to give. That's right. Mm -hmm. And you can testify as to that you have heard someone who you may have thought was spiritually inferior to you say something that was way ahead of where you were at. That's God. This is how God works. And he sent, uh, he sent gifts to them as well, as well as wagons and provisions and gifts. Gave each man a changes of raiment. And Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. And Jacob, oh, he sent him 20 asses. Loaded up. 20. I mean, it's just hard to conceive, you know. But this is what he did for his father. He changes a raiment. What would that just mean? A new different colors, a new set of clothes, different color or something? Well, it went a little further than that, and I found that there's a general consensus on this. The word itself means the elegant garments. They weren't like work clothes, running clothes. They were kind of clothes you could stand before Pharaoh in. Yeah. Oh. Amen. Yeah. See, there were special clothes in Scripture. When Esther stood before the king, she put on some special clothes. Right. Amen. Royal apparel, mm -hmm. Scripture calls it. And Solomon's court, all the people that served him, they, they appeared before him in their apparel. See, it was special this, I'm sure, is what this was about. They were, they were clothing, elegant clothing for special occasions, the peak of which for them would be when they appeared before Pharaoh and when they appeared before Joseph. They'd be dressed appropriately when they were there. <clears throat> now, the parallel in spiritual life ought to be obvious. There's special clothing that we're expected to, uh, to wear. Clothed with humility, that's a good kind of an undergarment, kind of clothed with a humility put on Christ that's a like a royal robe put on the new man that's like the clothing under the robe put on bowels of mercies kindness humbleness of mind meekness long suffering charity see you're expected to put on some elegant garments so to speak befitting for the uh, for the occasion it's even uncomely to appear before God or even before men without this royal apparel. Come before God every day, you know, this is not appropriate. You need to cleanse your mind, cleanse yourself, not start the unclean thing, discipline your mind, think about the Lord, separate from other things. This is important. Have the right have the right apparel. Can we get yes. Sometimes when you look at somebody's apparel, you can tell yeah. where they're from, yes. where they're going, yeah. where they've come from, mm -hmm. and how this is the way the Lord has made it, because when someone of the world sees a believer, it's obvious to them that that person is yeah. a believer because of the spiritual apparel. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. And sometimes even the outward apparel is yeah. modest. Is modest. Uh -huh. That's know? right. 
you saw someone, you saw someone appear in a string bikini, you wouldn't say, now there's a believer for you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Peril is important. Mm -hmm. How about the Benjamin? Now he gave him 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. Well, there are people like that that are favored. Uh -huh. Benjamin was special to Joseph. Seth was special to Adam. David is special to Jonathan. Mm -hmm. On down the line we can go. Those who are favored will have more to wear. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. just the way it, is. it just isn't like just status. Uh -huh. yeah. Favored people get something more. So let's say that, that you do know more than the average Christian. It's because you were favored. You really got to see this. It isn't because, like, you studied more. It's because you're favored. This is how the kingdom works. Who's favored gets more. That way God gets all the glory. Amen. And generally the people who get more are expected to do more. That's just the way it works, too. Now, I've got to approach this... Uh, Cautiously, this, this subject cautiously, so I don't present a distorted picture. Those who are more thoroughly involved in this great salvation will realize more of its benefits. Now, there, I, this is not intended to provoke judging one another. This is not, but this now this is the way it is. If, for example, you really do do this, you draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and your body's well washed with pure water, washed with pure water, you'll receive much more than those who do not. Yeah, it's really not enough to acknowledge what we ought to do. See, we are living in a Christian society where it's enough to say, well, we ought to do that and we ought to do the other. Everybody ought to do this. See, and they think that that's enough. To know that you, that's not enough. It's the doing of it. Yeah. Things got to actually be done. Yeah. There must be corresponding action of faith that takes hold of the promises. For Jacob, Joseph sent 20 donkeys loaded with supplies. That showed his highest regard was for his father. Yeah. He, he had a high regard for Benjamin, his brother, but he had a really high regard for God, yeah. for J Jacob, his father. That's the same with us. We have a high regard for our brethren. Yeah. We have a much, much higher regard for Christ. Uh -huh. And then we have the highest regard for the God and Father of the Lord Jesus yeah. Christ who sent him and Amen. gave him for, yeah. for our sins. <laughs> We've been granted uh, better things. Yeah. Like you said, the good of Egypt. The good of Egypt is yours. When you get here, there'll be a lot better things. We've been granted better things, better things. We have a better hope and a better testament, better sacrifice, a better and enduring substance, a better country, a better thing, blood of sprinkling speaks better things, best gifts. See, we've got, <laughs> in Christ, we got a lot better things than we had in the world. Amen. These in experience and expectation have been provided for our journey. Mm -hmm. See, they're, they're not an end to themselves. It's, this, the objective just isn't to get a lot of gifts. The objective is to have a triumphant journey to the glory. Yeah. To be able to get there safe and sound and fully nourished. Yeah. What a reproach it is for re professing Christians to live on meager supplies. Yeah. See, this is, this is a sin of tremendous magnitude. Yeah. We don't speak a whole lot about it because it's difficult it calls for diagnosis that only God can make. So the best we can do is just like announce this. If you try and live on meager portions, we can't guarantee you'll make it. And we do want you to make it. Yes. Peter did talk about an abundant interest. Yes, abundant interest. Yes, that's what these provisions are for. That's right. Yeah, have an abundant interest. That's not, right. Not just barely make it across the finish line and drop. That's yeah. right. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. It's like the earnest <laughs> of the inheritance. That's mm -hmm. right. Amen. 
The parallels are, are very edifying. <laughs> now he gives a word to them because he knows them real well. Now see that you fall not out by the way. Time had come for the brothers to be separated from him for a season, and he knew them real well. Uh -huh. Don't be fussing along the way. Oh. Don't get caught up in arguments along the way. Yeah. Till you fall that out by the way. Yeah. Now, there's different ways that they have translated this, with some of which are very miserable. New King James says, don't become troubled along the way. New American Standard says, don't quarrel on the journey. Basic Bible English says, have no argument on the road. Don't be worried about the trip. One version says, don't argue on the way. You see, uh, he's not talking about don't fret. That's not what he's talking about here. He knows how prone they were to fuss. Even when they were going to sell him, you know, they could think it's like they argued about how to do it. They had an argument about it. Then when they were at Joseph, before Joseph, and they met, brought up what they'd done to Joseph, they had another argument ensued. Reuben said, I told you, you know, and it, this was their propensity was to argue. Don't. This is not the time to be arguing when you're in the wagons on your way to, to the glory. This is not the time to do that. That's why we're to avoid contentions about words and unprofitable things. That's why that's there. That's why that's said. We don't want trouble to break out in the wagons. Amen. Don't fall out by the way. That's right. They all came together. That's Somebody right. would have lost out or, or not went along with them. No wonder the Bible said, now, be at peace among yourselves. See, that's the New Covenant way of saying the same thing. Be kind to one another. Be tenderhearted. Forgiving one another. See, that's along, that's along the way talk. Amen. See, uh, now Satan will tempt the best of people to consider, quote, the Christian life as just here and now what we do here and now. But no, it's, it's on the way. We're in a, involved in a pilgrimage Amen. to a better country. That is a heaven. And we, and if you, but if you lose that perspective, then these, these contentions start to break out. Arguments about things that, uh, well, we just don't want to argue about them. One of the damnable things about Babylon the Great, the religion, a form of religion without power, is that it's introduced fussing and fighting along the way. Yeah, amen. Mm -hmm. And boy, it's taken hold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some people think the wagons have a name on them, like a Baptist wagon, a Methodist wagon, no, Pentecostal wagon, Restoration wagon. No. But that is it. It's, these are all Jacob's wagons. Yeah. Amen. Part of the whole family, heaven and earth. Divisions and contentions have resulted from erroneous ideas that the charlatans have promoted because the religion that is popular allows that to happen. It was ever a member that to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Those in whose hearts the peace of God is found will not be disposed to argue and contend along the way. That will not be their preference. Sometimes there will be disputes. We understand that. Sometimes there'll be disagreements. They should all be short-lived. They should not be uh, extended, but there will be some. But just know this, the wisdom that's from above, from above, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. So if you encounter wisdom that's not that, it didn't come from above. It came from beneath, which is earthly and sensual and devilish. So they went up out of Egypt and came into the land. They, it's they're going back to Canaan. They went up out of Egypt, came into the land of Canaan, and to Jacob their father. Now, as I mentioned to you, I estimate this trip about 200 miles. 
but nothing is said about the trip itself, about the experiences of the trip itself, or what they saw, or what it, one of the wheels fell off, or there's nothing about the trip itself, and this seems to be characteristic of the way God makes his reports. For instance, um, Abraham traveled from Ur to Haran, but we don't know one thing about what happened in between uh, Ur, Chaldees, and Haran. Didn't give any details. He traveled from Haran to Canaan, and the details of what happened there. And he, then he traveled from Canaan down to Egypt during the famine, and that, the trip itself, nothing said about it. And Abraham traveled from Egypt back to Canaan, and there's nothing about the trip itself. Abraham's servant traveled from Canaan to Mesopotamia to get a wife for Isaac, but the trip itself, they don't comment on. Abraham's servant and Rebekah traveled from Mesopotamia back to Canaan, and they, it'll just say they, they left here and they got there. That's about what it doesn't tell what, what happened along the way. Isaac traveling to Gerar from the Beersheba area, Beth, Bethel area. No, no details given. Isaac traveling from the land of the Philistines to Beersheba. No, no details are given. Details. Jacob traveling from Canaan to Padanaram to Laban's house. No details. Jacob traveling from Padanaram back to Mount Gilead. No details. Jacob after confronting Laban until he confronted Esau. That there's no details. Joseph's trip to from Dothan to Egypt when he was sold. No. No details. Joseph's brother's first traveling from Canaan to Egypt. We're talking about a trip now of a couple hundred miles. Joseph's brother's returning from Egypt to Canaan. No details. Joseph's brother's second trip. No details. Joseph's brother's second trip from Egypt to Canaan. Now being reported. No details. Well, see, men would have read a book on each one of those trips. Very little, and most of the time, nothing is reported of the journey itself or any subjective experiences along the way. There are reports like visions, dreams, things like this. Joseph's brothers di discovered the money in their sacks and found it. Joseph's cup was found in Benjamin's sack, but the journey itself is not spelled out. All right. Now, there's something to be seen here. The people of God are not to get bogged down about daily experience. Yeah. Now, I'll tell you, there's a lot of reasons why. One is that's not how God works. The other is men can capitalize on pieces of life. Everybody who's created a system by which to live, whether it's to recover, how to raise your children, or whatever, they capitalize on the details of life, but God doesn't. God will just group it together and say, whatever you do. Huh? Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give me thanks to God and the Father by him. That's how he talks about the details. If you've never seen that, it's, it has kind of a jarring <laughs> implication. Freedom in that too, because you can you can do all things heartily as unto the Lord, and and be accepted. And, right. and, and, and if you've got to scrub the floor, you can do it as unto the Lord and be accepted. Amen. Now, if you have a bad experience today, just treat it like a bad experience today, Amen. and keep keep on the keep on the highway. Don't Amen. don't get derailed by. Heartbreaking experiences. You're going to have them if you haven't had them yet. You, you will. They'll come to you. Well, they went to Jacob, their father. When they got there, and notice it just it just says they left Egypt and they they then they're, then they're standing before Jacob. <laughs> the curiosity about what? I wonder what happened along the way. One wonder how they talked with one. See, it just skips over all of that. And they got there, and they, they told him what they were told to him. Joseph is yet alive. Well, how those words must have been like a spear, like a dagger. Whoa. I've been living for 22 years thinking Joseph's dead, and now all of a sudden, they, Joseph's yet alive. Oh, I, I can imagine. Oh, dear. <laughs> Come on, boys. Let's get serious here. 
See, just the first sound of it would be abrasive to someone who's living in, in sorrow. A living Joseph now couldn't be hidden indefinitely. A living Joseph will it'll, it'll surface eventually. Can't ultimately be, ultimately be concealed. And then you learn Jacob nor his, his brother had really forgotten Joseph. Now, nobody said, who's that? Yeah, they hadn't forgotten about yeah. Joseph. They still remembered about him. But this was a sharp contradiction to everything Jacob thought. Yeah. It's, it's like, a, like a knife stabbing through flesh. Uh -huh. You've been completely wrong these last 22 years. You have thought the wrong thing these last 22 years. Joseph's yet alive. Yet, yet alive. But he never did die. That's right. Amen. And then they, they add something on top of that. They said, he's governor over all the land of Egypt. Whoa, you got to put yourself in Jacob's shoes now. You mean that little boy that had those dreams that I sent out there to find out where you brothers were? That, that joke is governor of all the land of Egypt? Yeah, that was their announcement. These are the facts that were reported in they're difficult for the mind to process. See, this is difficult, but that God intends, he intends for good news to be difficult to process. Yeah. He intends that what he announces to humanity cannot be easily processed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is by intention. Yeah. Because there are great things. <coughs> In man's pertaining to life and godliness, <coughs> there are realities that tax the capability of the human mind. And some people can brush it aside, you brush it aside, well, God can do anything. So they don't think much about it. Consequently, they don't trust much in it. See, it's one thing to say, God can do anything. It's another thing to trust in that. Oh, that's something else entirely. Not the same thing at all. See, it's one thing to say Joseph's alive and he's governor of Egypt, but until Jacob believes this, he's not about to go to Egypt. So what's he do? Jacob's heart faints. Some of the other versions says his heart stood still. He was stunned. Jacob was overcome. Jacob's heart nearly failed. He was as he awaked out of a deep sleep. His heart became numb. He was amazed, so forth. Here's an instance where various versions, uh, they confuse, uh, kind of confuse the text. Here's 15 different versions of this text. Now, the text was Jacob fainted. All right, here's, here's 15. His heart fainted. His heart stood still. He was stunned. He was quite overcome. He wakes, as it were, out of a sleep, deep sleep. His heart became numb. He was amazed. He was unmoved. He was as one stunned. His heart ceased. His heart was like a stone. He receded in his thoughts. He became cynical or pessimistic. His heart froze up. His heart began to stop beating, and he almost fainted. What does that mean? That means that's not an easy thing to translate. <laughs> it means a lot here. I do not see this as a mere emotional response. It had to be more than that. See, man is comprised of spirit, soul, and body. And one of those cannot be affected without touching the others. Something that impacts your spirit touches your soul and your body. Something that impacts your body touches your soul and your spirit. So I think its whole person was affected by this. Yeah. Some are of the opinion his heart stopped beating. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised. I understand in some fainting, that's what actually happens. The heart stops beating because of the makeup of man. You got to see the makeup of man is very intricate. So if you're, if you're it, within or depressed, it even affects how you look. It affects your whole person because of the way you're made up. Of course, on the, on the other hand, if you're filled with joy, yeah. <laughs> it affects your whole person. 
You should tell people if you're happy and don't notify your face, please. <laughs> so I, I, my own persuasion is that this had a, a, a significant impact on Joe's, Jacob's entire person. How he thought, how he felt, everything about him. I wouldn't be surprised that his, that his heart may have stopped beating. Then he tells you why it was this way. It wasn't because of the report. It's because he believed them not. That's what caused that. He, be, he didn't believe. That's what caused that. <laughs> you can see this, can't you, that? It parallels the report of Christ's resurrection. It's the kind of same thing happened. Here comes Mary Magdalene says, he appeared to me. He appeared to me personally. Ah, come on, Mary. Then the women turn up say, we met him. He, he, we met him in the way. He told us to tell you to meet him in Galilee. Well, come on. Then here come the two, two on the road to Emmaus. They ran back and they reported it. But the disciples, they didn't believe any of those people. Mary Magdalene, the women, two on the road to Emmaus, they didn't believe any of them. And when Jesus did finally appear, what's the first thing he did? He upbraided them because of their unbelief. Because yeah, right. somebody told them I was alive. Uh -huh. <laughs> Jesus is alive. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't believe him. Yeah. And then when Jesus come across the two on the road to Emmaus, they were moping down the road. Yeah. Moping down the road. Why? Because they didn't believe. Yeah. Why do people drag and drag over there, drag, drag into life? Why? They don't believe. Yep. Amen. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. yeah. Give them some good news to believe. Yeah. Amen. So good news, real good news. Yeah. Well, it says they told him all the words of Joseph. Boy, he, he gave a lot to tell them. It was the Joseph that they sold Egypt. Remember, he told them that I'm the Joseph. I am the Joseph you sold into Egypt. Yeah. So it's that one, Dad. It's the one we sold. Mm. Which he didn't hear. He hadn't heard that before. Yeah, that's right. Jacob hadn't heard that before. And God sent him there. He told us told us to tell you this. That God sent him there before us. Yeah. And God sent him there to preserve life. And there, there's also there's five more years of famine that are coming because they didn't they didn't have someone to interpret the dream to them. They didn't know about that those dreams that uh, Pharaoh had. See, they didn't know how long this famine was. There's five more years of famine, and God sent him to preserve a posterity. We got to keep the family. Abraham's seed have to has to continue, and they're not going to be able to do it in Canaan right now. We got to get him into Egypt. God sent them there to save the lives, save their lives by a great deliverance. And I don't doubt that that was like a prophecy of coming out of Egypt. Uh -huh. They did not send them to Egypt. God did. And God made them a father to Pharaoh. Tell, tell, tell my father that God made me a father to Pharaoh. So that suddenly, instead of me being like a son to him, he was like a son to me. God made him Lord over the Pharaoh's house. Tell him that. Tell him God made him ruler throughout the land of Egypt. Say to their father, this is, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. They told, they told Jacob that. They would dwell in the land of Goshen. Told him that. They would dwell there with their children, their children's children, their flocks, their herds, and all the hand. Joseph would nourish them during the remaining five years of famine, lest all of them and what they come and what they had come to poverty. All of them, including Jacob, would see that what Joseph had said was the truth. They were to tell their father of Joseph's glory and all that they had seen. See? Yeah. Well, they had a lot to report. For the first, this first time, this is the first time Jacob heard this. Joseph also told them all these words, all these words to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh decreed, saying to thy brethren, This do ye, laid your asses, go get ye into the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households, and come here unto me. 
I'll give them the good of the land of Egypt. Ye shall eat the fat of the land. Joseph, take you wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones, for your wives. Bring your father and come. They were not to be concerned about the goods, about their goods, Pharaoh said, for the good of the land of Egypt is yours. He, he told them. These are all things they told their father. Then there was also the matter of the gifts. Remember, he sent some gifts. There's 20 asses loaded up with gifts for Jacob. Ten asses laden with good things of Egypt. That's like non-edibles. Mm -hmm. Ten she-asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father. By the way, see, this is for, uh -huh. for the journey. <laughs> There's a lot to digest. and It was all good. But then Jacob lifted up his eyes. Yeah. And he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to him. <laughs> yeah, he couldn't take that. That did it. Yeah. That did it. He saw the wagons. Visualized what they said. There it was. Visualized. And his spirit revived. Oh, he wasn't cast down. Anymore. All right, this is familiar, similar to the disciples reaction to the resurrected Christ. After Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples. They were terrified and affrighted and supposed they'd seen a spirit. See? He then showed them his hands and feet. Look here, look here. Look at the service. Hands and feet. Yet they believed not. Then he asked them, have you, have you any meat here? Anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. And he said, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of the prophets, and law of Moses and the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. As he showed them all this evidence, see? Mm -hmm. Then he opened their understanding. Yeah. So they could understand the scriptures, and he expounded unto them the reason for his death. For the disciples, this was like Jacob being revived, see? Yeah, yeah. Something similar happens to every believer. They get their report, and it seems too good to be true, you know, what's in Christ. But then we've got to show them the evidence. Look at here. Here's, look at Saul. This is, this is Saul of Tarsus. Remember Saul of Tarsus? Remember him? This is him over here. Whoa. How'd that happen? Yeah, this is what we've been talking about. What did Israel do? He said, it's enough. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to tell me anymore. You don't have to show me anymore. And I wanted to just say a word about the kingdom perspective of evidence. Evidence is not, here's one piece of evidence. Here's another disassociated piece of evidence. Here's another piece of evidence. It's cumulative. Here's this evidence, more stacked on top of it. More stacked on top of it, making more weight down here. More stacked on top of this. More stacked pretty soon. He's, it's enough. I, I got the message. I got the message. Now, that's how evidence works. Amen. You can't let go of any evidence you've ever had. Yeah. Keep it. Mm -hmm. It'll stack up, and finally it'll tip the scale. Is it? You won't have to say it anymore. Just show me where to get in the wagon. Yeah. It's enough. Joseph had weighed the evidence, and the evidence... See, the gospel is like an account of the evidence. Yeah, yeah. Christ died. Uh -huh. Christ buried. Christ is raised. Yeah. Christ ascended. Uh -huh. Christ is enthroned. Uh -huh. Christ is reigning. See, and then they're just... I'm persuaded. Yeah. And being convinced, you, you come in. And he said, I'll go. I'll go and see him before I die. He didn't deem it, deem, it, deem it possible. We learned later he was 130 years old. He's going to live to be 150 some, 157. So he's going to live 17 more years, 27 more years. Anyway, he's going to live several more years after he gets to Canaan. So it's 130. He didn't dream he'd ever see Joseph again. But he was going to, I'll go and I'll see him before I die. That's what we're saying. 
That's why we've been willing to give up the things of the world and change our way of living and inconvenience our flesh for God. That's why. That's why we, we, we made up our mind we're going. Amen. We're going, and we're going to see him as he is. We're going to stand before we aim to stand before him without a spot or wrinkle or any such thing. We're, we've been convinced. So I just I would ask you, have you, been, have you been convinced? If you have, we know you'll continue in the journey. If you haven't been, that's part of our ministry is to convince you. Keep on piling on this evidence. Every time you see someone that grows up into Christ, that's evidence. Yeah. Every time you see someone that forsakes sin, drops off a weight that's so easily possessive, that's evidence. Yeah. See, it's, so if you'd see it right, there's evidence going on all around you yeah. Yeah. as to the truth of these things. I think I'll close there. It's a lot, it's a lot more in this text, I know, but I'll leave that with you. Any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? about the Lord's mercy and the timing of his revelation. Whenever he gives the knowledge to his people, particularly thinking about Jacob receiving the knowledge of some of the things that had happened in the past, that mm -hmm. he just recently learned, for example, that his other sons had sold his beloved yes. into slavery. Yeah. Think about what a burden that would have been to carry that knowledge this whole yes. time. Yeah. But the Lord revealed that to him when there was a good resolution to the whole situation. That's good. Yeah. That's and good. the Lord the Lord is very merciful in doing that for his people a lot of times. He will he will make the revelations about some of the things that we really need to know, but it's at a time when there has yeah. been a resolution made. So oh, we don't have to amen. bear that for long. Very yeah. yeah. good insight. Amen. Yeah. Amen. The uh, the raiment that he sent for them to change into after they got there. And they had to keep he didn't wait till they got there and have it sent to them, you know. Yes. But he, they had, he sent it to them ahead of time. Yeah. They had a journey with that, so they had to, like, recognize, you know, we, we're not going to wear these now. Yeah. They had to put that up, see, and keep up with it, and keep it nice and clean, and all these things. Yeah, so uh, I thought that yeah. was interesting that he sent that. Uh, didn't wait till they got there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes, amen. Yes, yeah, the uh, the gifts and the wagon and the abundance, it was all to confirm That's right. that Joseph was a governor in Egypt. That's right. Amen. See, because there are gifts that only a king can give. Yeah. Amen. You notice he didn't send back a crust of bread and some water and say, I'm in Egypt ruling. <laughs> he sent yeah. gifts that kings can, that's right. can, can do. That's king could send. And, and that's, right, what, that's what Jesus has done for us. Mm -hmm. He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. He ministers things that only he can give. Uh -huh. yeah. and, that, and that's a confirmation that he's at the right hand of the Father. Mm -hmm. and this, that's why it is so wrong to commend to people a Jesus that gives common things. Mm -hmm. Earthly things. Temporary things. Yeah. Amen. That is that is dishonoring to the name of Jesus, yeah. who's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Yeah. If you if you want to appeal to people's faith, uh -huh. you've got to offer them something that they can't get from man or from earth or from nature. Uh -huh. <laughs> Amen. If anybody, if the United Way can do it, it's like a so what. Yeah. Uh -huh. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Are you gonna Yes. Um, I'm concerned with Brother Tony and Brother Ricky's comments that that um, Joseph didn't wait till they had gotten there to give him all these provisions because not only were they getting provisions for their journey, but they were also getting taste of what they yeah. would receive in Egypt. Yeah, and it did. was mm -hmm. sort of like a boosting their confidence, so to speak. That way it wasn't a huge transition for them. It was Smooth. They were able to just step Amen. Right this is the kind of food we're going to have <laughs> in abundance. Amen. We won't have to send anymore. Yeah. yeah. Pick it up. Amen. Emma. Um, I was thinking when Joseph heard, uh, when Pharaoh heard that Joseph's brethren were coming, it would, and he was pleased. He was pleased because he heard Joseph's name and Joseph's brethren were coming. So I was thinking yeah. when. We go before God, Jesus' name is going to please him. Yeah. So. That's right. Amen. It will be Jesus, brethren. Yeah, that's, yeah, right. that's good. <laughs> yes. I was thinking 
something similar to that too about about whenever they um, the brethren told um, the, him all the words of Joseph. It reminded me of us confessing to the Lord that we know Christ yeah. and that He is alive and these things that He's gave us because of Him and what He's doing. You know that He's over all things. How pleasing this must be to the Lord whenever He hears us. Yeah. Confess to him these things about his son. Amen. So. Amen. 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 All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this record of Joseph. We thank you for Joseph, a very real person that shows us the real, very real power of faith and and how we can endure over long periods of time with no outward advantage. We ask, Lord, you would give us grace to be walk pleasing in your sight so we will not be ashamed before you at Christ's coming. In Jesus' name, amen.